العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد In the name of Allah the most merciful the one who bestows mercy Indeed our praise is due to Allah the Lord of the world and may peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his family, companions and all those who follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until the yawm al-qiyamah So this is the first of four lessons by the permission of Allah regarding as salah the rulings uh, pertaining to as salah And one of the main differences between Islam and between the other religions of Al-Kufr is that Islam is based upon learning and knowledge. And knowledge in Islam, it isn't restricted to a special group of people. So we don't have in our religion a special group of people and only they read the scriptures. Like the Yahud and the Nasara Ahlul Kitab, the monks and the rabbis, the knowledge of the scriptures is restricted to them. Not like this in Islam. So in Islam, every single Muslim has to learn. And every single Muslim has to read. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it isn't permitted for a person, it isn't permitted for a person to worship Allah upon ignorance. Inna Allah la yu'bad ala jahal. Allah is not worshipped upon ignorance. Allah is only worshipped based upon a person's knowledge. And like the brother mentioned, the first word which was revealed to the Prophet wasallam was Iqra. And Iqra is a command to read and recite and also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he obligated seeking knowledge upon every single Muslim he said Talabul ilmi faridatun ala kulli Muslim seeking knowledge and learning is an obligation upon every single Muslim so our religion the religion of Islam it is based upon and it is built upon the Muslims the men and the women young and old learning about al-islam learning about allah and learning how to please and worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this knowledge that we have to learn this knowledge it can be divided into two areas firstly a person has to learn knowledge about his aqeedah about his or her belief this is the first aspect of seeking knowledge and the second aspect of seeking knowledge is learning about the actions. So our religion, all of it is made up of these two halves. The first half is your belief. The second half is your actions. And you have to learn about the beliefs, beliefs and you have to also learn about the actions. The beliefs is like learning about Tawheed, learning about Iman. The six pillars of Iman. Learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the first 
obligations in our religion is that we have to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to know Him. We have to be aware of Him. And this is one of the reasons why Allah created us. So one of, our, one of the objectives behind our creation is to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, لِتَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ So you may know that Allah has complete ability over everything. لِتَعْلَمُوا So you may know. Allah said, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ Know and have knowledge that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. So one of the reasons why we were placed upon this earth is to actually learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a point that many people, they miss out. We know Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create jinn or mankind except that they should worship me. Many people when they speak about why have you been placed upon this earth? What is the objective behind your creation? They will say it is ibadah. Because Allah said, I did not create jinn nor mankind except that they should worship me. But before this objection, before this objective or purpose is another objective. And that is we were also created and put upon this earth to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first half of Islam is a person's belief, a person's tawheed, a person's aqeedah, a person's iman. We have to learn about all of these things. The second half of Islam is amal, is actions. So there are righteous actions that we have to learn about. And from these actions, the most important of them is a salah So the actions that we have to learn about, there are many different actions. We need to know how to make hajj. We need to know how to give zakah. And who do we give zakah to? And how much do we give zakah to those people? We have to learn about fasting, we have to learn about hijab, we have to learn about jihad and da'wah. So many actions that we have to learn about. But the most important out of all of these actions is what is the salah. And when we say salah, we are referring to the five daily prayers which are an obligation upon every single male and female Muslim. So the most important action, it is your salah. The first uh, pillar of Islam after Shahada that La ilaha illa wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah is a salah. The first action that a person is going to be asked about on Yawm al Qiyamah is the salah. Awwalu ma yuhasibu bihi al Abd Yawm al Qiyamah as salah. The first thing that a person will be held accountable for on Yawm al Qiyamah is the prayer. So if a person gives so much in zakah, so much in charity, builds so many masajid, does so many other actions, does so much da'wah. But the salah, he is not diligent upon the salah. Then all of these actions are worthless. Because the first action which a person is asked about is the salah. And also the salah, the five daily prayers, this is the difference between a person's Islam and a person's kufr. Meaning, the Salah, this is the action which is the difference between Islam and Al-Kufr. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِنَّ الْأَحْدَ الَّذِي بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ الصَّلَاةِ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرْ The difference between us and them, meaning the Mushrikun, is the Salah. A difference in action. So whoever abandons the Salah, meaning out of laziness, he has left Al-Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بَيْنَ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْءِ وَكُفْرِهِ الصَّلَاةِ Between the Islam of a person and between the kufr of a person is the salah. So the action which differentiates us from the non-Muslims is the salah. And so whoever abandons these five daily prayers out of laziness, then he has fallen into disbelief. Also, the Salah is better than every other action. Every other action, whether it is Fard or Nafal, then the Salah is better than all of them. And one of the things which shows why Salah is better and more important than all of the other actions is think about where the actions were legislated. 
So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to legislate or obligate something, He would send Jibreel. And Jibreel alayhi salam would come from the heavens and He would come to the earth. And then Jibreel alayhi salam would teach the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that which Allah has commanded. There was one, and, and this is the same in every single action. And then there's one action which is different to this, and it is the salah. So when it came to the five daily prayers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send Jibreel alayhi salam. And they were not legislated upon the earth. Rather, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was taken up to the seven heavens, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbu samawati wal ard, He obligated the five daily prayers. Every other action between the Prophet and Allah was Jibreel alayhi salam. The five daily prayers, there's nobody between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All the other actions between the Prophet and Allah was Jibreel. As for the salah, it was direct from Allah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of the other actions were legislated upon the earth. The salah was legislated in the heavens. The first action which was, which was obligated upon the Muslims in Mecca was the Salah. In fact, it was the only action. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he lived 13 years in Mecca as a Prophet and a Messenger. From these 13 years, no other righteous action was <laughs> obligated, only the Salah. And then when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Mecca to al Madina, were all of the other actions legislated and obligated. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He attached in the Qur'an, Iman to a person's Salah. It's not, pers it's not possible for a person to be a true Mu'min and to be righteous and to have Taqwa and be a Wali of Allah without the five daily prayers, the obligatory prayers. Leave the Nawafil. We're not even talking about the Nawafil. Before the Nawafil are the five obligatory prayers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, قُلْ لِعِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يُقِيمُوا الصَّلَةِ Say, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to my people who have accepted Iman, يُقِيمُوا الصَّلَةِ That they should establish the prayer. So look, if you want to be a true mu'min, then you have to establish the five daily prayers. Also, consider in the Qur'an, Whenever the word salah is mentioned, Allah mentions aqimu salah, aqimu salah. He doesn't say sallu, he says aqimu salah. And there's a difference between saying sallu and aqimu salah. So the word sallu, it is a command to pray. But aqimu salah is a command to pray properly, to establish the prayer, to pray in its correct time. To pray like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam prayed. This action, the salah is so important that all of the other actions, a person has to be over the age of puberty for it for them to be an obligation. Except the salah. The salah starts well before puberty. When a Muslim is 10 years old. When a Muslim is 10 years old, then he is disciplined for not praying. If he doesn't pray, then he's to be disciplined upon praying. And in fact, even before this, when the child is seven years old, then the parents have to train and cultivate and teach the child upon praying five times a day. So when the child is seven or ten years old, then it's the parent's responsibility. As soon as he goes above ten and he starts going towards puberty, now it's his responsibility. And that's why... A 13, 14, 15 year old Muslim can never give an excuse that my parents did not tell me about the prayer. My parents didn't wake me up for Fajr. Because as soon as a Muslim is towards the age of puberty, 14, 15 years old, it is his responsibility to set his own alarm and to sleep early in order to wake up the next day for Al Fajr. So, being told about the prayer and you're 14 years old or you're 15 years old, it's not your parents' responsibility. It's not your mother's responsibility. It's your responsibility. Your parents' responsibility starts at 7. That they have to order you and train and cultivate you with the prayer. 
and, and, and also at 10, that they have to forcefully discipline you upon the prayer. After this, it's your responsibility. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Murru abna'akum bisalati wa hum abna'a Order your children to pray and they are seven years old. وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ عَشَرٌ And then discipline them over it and they are ten years old. The salah is so important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set certain times in the day in which a person has to pray. So even when it comes to the timing of the salah, it isn't open for a person to pray whenever he wants. Doesn't wake up Fajr, misses Dhuhr, prays all of it at Asr time, leaves Maghrib to the Isha. It's not allowed. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated five times in the day in which a person has to pray in them. And He said in the Quran, Inna salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitabam mawquta. Verily, the salah upon the believers, kitabam mawquta. It has a time in which it has to be prayed. So the Salah, the five daily prayers, this is a relationship between a person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the five daily prayers, this is the sign or the indicator of a person's Iman and a person's Deen. It's not possible. In fact, it was never ever known. In 1400 years of Islam, it's never been known that there is a Muslim who doesn't pray the five daily prayers until we came to these last 20, 30 years. And the Iman of the people, it became down. And now you hear people saying, I'm a practicing Muslim or I'm a non-practicing Muslim. I'm a Muslim, but I only pray Jumu'ah in a week. I don't pray any other prayer. I'm a Muslim, but I don't know the Masjid except on Fridays. This, is, this has never been a part of Islam. All of the generations who came before us, the most jahil amongst them, the most ignorant amongst them, they had the five daily prayers. And then we come to this time today, in which people, they came to have knowledge about Islam, and yet the most basic actions, the five daily prayers, they attach no importance to them. So, the indicator of a person's Iman, the indicators of a person's deen is what? Is the five daily prayers. And a person isn't allowed to leave these five daily prayers for any excuse. It doesn't matter if a person's in a war, or he's running away from even an animal, or he's driving. If the time for the prayer comes, then that person has to pray. Even if a person is paralyzed, and we're going to discuss this later on. A person is paralyzed, cannot move, cannot make wudu, cannot make tayammum, doesn't know where the qibla is. Even in this situation, the person still has to pray. So there's no excuse for a person not to pray. And the Prophet wasallam he described the five daily prayers as being the pillar of a person's religion. He said, Rasul Amr al-Islam that the head of the affair of the religion, it is Al-Islam, meaning at tawheed The core of this religion is Al-Islam, meaning at tawheed وَعُمُودُهُ الصَّلَةِ And its pillar is the Salah. Any building which is supported by pillars. If you take those pillars away, what happens? The whole building it comes down upon a person. This is an evidence that for a person to leave the Salah out of laziness, he falls into kufr and he leaves the fold of Al-Islam. Just like that building is destroyed when, there is, when the pillar is taken away. And more than this, the Salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered for certain buildings to be built. Certain places to be built in which people are encouraged to come and pray Salah in them. And they are the Masajid. And these Masajid, look at the beautiful name Allah gave them, He called them the houses. Baytullah, the house of Allah. He said, Fi buyutin adhin Allah an turfa'a In houses which Allah has ordered to be built and raised. 
i.e. in order for us to pray our salah in these masajid and on top of this we still have to also pray at home and the masjid or a person can pray the salah anywhere upon the earth because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said جُعِلَتْ لِيَ الْأَرْضُ مَسْجِدُ that the whole earth it has been made a masjid for me for this ummah the whole earth is a place of salah except the graveyard except the dirty places like the toilets akramakumullah except these places so all of these things which I mentioned all of these show us the importance of the five daily prayers if a person is not going to do any other action and he's going to commit every other sin the one thing that a Muslim should never ever leave are the five daily prayers and don't think and don't be deceived by shaitan that I'm doing so many sins how can I do my five daily prayers doesn't matter what the sin you're doing doesn't matter which other action you are abandoning and leaving but the five daily prayers a person should never leave the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that between one prayer and another prayer is the expiation of the sins so for example a person prays Fajr and then Shaitan tempts this person he falls into some sins then Dhuhr times comes so he prays Dhuhr the time the sins between Fajr and Dhuhr they are wiped away because of the two prayers you pray so then he prays Dhuhr and then maybe he falls into more sins and then Asr time comes so then he prays Asr the sins between Dhuhr and Asr are wiped away because of the two Salah that this person prayed the Prophet وسلم, he described them like being a river which is flowing and it's as if between each Salah you bathe yourself in water and you come out and you are clean again so whatever other action a person doesn't do or whatever sin a person does but the five daily prayers a person cannot leave them and like I said it doesn't matter if a person is ill or healthy or rich or poor or sad angry happy it doesn't matter where he is what he's doing what action he's in but he cannot abandon the prayer of that time and the most important thing about the five daily prayers is knowing their rulings we need to know before we pray which things should we be doing and during our prayer what things do we have to do we have to also know which things are disliked for us to do whilst we're praying and we have to know which things break our prayer and then we need to know that if our prayer is broken then what do we do how do we make up a prayer which is invalid all of these things we need to study and before we start studying these things we need to understand what is the meaning of the word salah salatun this Arabic word what does it actually mean so salah in the Arabic language so we're not talking about the meaning of salah Islamically just salah in the Arabic language how the Arabs use it in their daily conversations it means a dua a salah it means a dua to make a supplication Allah said in the Quran was salli alayhim to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was salli alayhim meaning make dua for them supplicate for them as for the meaning of salah Islamically in fiqh it is aqwalun wa af'alun makhsusa muftatihatun bit takbir muhtatimatun bit tasneem this is the meaning of salah according to the fiqh of al-islam as salah it is aqwal some statements so as salah islamically it is certain statements wa af'al and certain actions makhsusa and these statements and these actions what do they begin with at takbir it begins with at takbir and what do they end with at taslim saying assalamu alaikum 
So when we talk about a salah and the rulings of salah, we're talking about these things, these actions and these statements which a person does and he begins these statements with the statement of takbir saying Allahu Akbar and he ends this ibadah with a taslim by saying Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. And I mentioned that a person who leaves the salah out of laziness has committed kufr, disbelief. And there is no difference amongst the ulama at all, no difference of opinion, that a person who leaves the salah out of laziness has fallen into kufr. No difference of opinion at all. A person who leaves the salah because he doesn't think it's an obligation, that person's a kafir straight away. So we're not talking about this person. We are talking about a person who believes the salah is wajib, but then because of laziness, he doesn't pray. This person, there is no difference amongst the madhahib and amongst the fuqaha and the ulama that his action is kufr. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he called it kufr. He said, al-ahdu alladhi bayna wa asaf, fa man tarakaha faqad kafar. The difference between us and them is the salah, so whoever leaves it, kafar. He has fallen into kufr. The only difference between the fuqaha is that this kufr is a kufrun akbar or is a kufrun asbar. This is the difference. That the kufr of this person, is it a major kufr, disbelief by which he leaves the fall of Islam, or is it minor kufr, which is still very, very dangerous, it is still kufr, but he hasn't yet left the fall of Islam. This is the only difference. And it's an... Uh, Error, I don't say it's an error, but it's a slight misunderstanding to say the ulama differed whether leaving the prayers kufr or not. They did not. All of them agree that it is kufr, but they only differed which type of kufr is it. Is it the kufr, the disbelief by which a person leaves the fold of Islam, or is it the kufr which is still disbelieved but he hasn't left the fold of al Islam? So, the first thing we need to study is that before you pray, before you pray, which actions do you have to fulfill before you start praying? And these are called shurut as-salah. Shurut as-salah, i.e. the conditions of the prayer. So a condition is an action which comes before the ibadah. This is the meaning of a condition. And this condition, if you don't fulfill it, then the prayer is not valid. And the conditions, the shurut, there's three types of conditions. Firstly, there is a general, the general conditions for every act of ibadah. Every act of ibadah has general conditions which have to be fulfilled. And these are called shurut qubul al-amal. The conditions for the acceptance of an action, any act of ibadah. And then there are shurutul wujub. Shurutul wujub are those conditions that have to be fulfilled in order for the salah to be a, an obligation upon you. Shurut al wujub. Conditions which have to be fulfilled inside you in order for the salah to be an obligation upon you. And then there are shurut al siha. And these are conditions you have to fulfill in order for your salah to be valid. So, shurut qubul al-amal, the conditions for any act of ibadah to be accepted are three. The first of them is al-ikhlas, sincerity, tawheed. So, if a person does any act of ibadah and he doesn't have tawheed, he doesn't have ikhlas, he isn't doing it purely for the sake of Allah, then that action is not accepted. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ They were not ordered except that they should worship Allah, making their actions mukhlisa, sincere for the sake of Allah. Secondly, al-ittiba. The second condition is, you have to follow the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam in that action. So we're not allowed to worship Allah upon bid'ah, upon innovations. We have to perform hajj like the Prophet wasallam performed hajj. 
We have to pray Salah like the Prophet Sallallahu prayed Salah. The sisters, they have to wear the hijab, not the hijab which they want, or not the hijab which is shown on YouTube, but the hijab which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered the Sahabiyat to wear unlike this. And then the third condition that some of the ulama they mention, especially when it comes to dua and salah, is that your eating has to be halal, your drinking has to be halal, your income has to be halal, your trading has to be halal. This is the third condition that the ulama mentioned specifically with regards to dua and as salah. And the evidence for this third condition is the hadith of that person, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day, Dhakara Rajula. He mentioned or he gave the example of a man. Yutilu Safar. And this man is on a very long journey. Ash'atha Agbar. And this man, he's on this long journey and he's very tired. And his hair, because of the troubles he's gone through, the struggle he's gone through, his appearance is not good. Then what does he do? Yarfa yadayhi ila sama. Then he raises his hands towards the sky, meaning he raises his hands towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's making dua, he's in need of Allah. Uh, his dua is sincere to Allah. Then he says, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, Oh my Lord, Oh my Lord. He calls out to Allah with his beautiful names. So, consider the example that the Prophet has given so far. He's on a journey, and we know that when a person is on a journey, the dua is accepted. The person is struggling, and we know that when a person is in trouble, that his dua is accepted. Then he raises his hands to the sky, and this is from the adab of the dua. To raise your hands in making dua, this is from the etiquette of So he fulfills the etiquette of the dua. Then when he makes dua, he makes dua to Allah alone. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. No shirk, no riya. He is calling only Allah. And then he's using the beautiful names of Allah. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. Everything he's fulfilling when it comes to the etiquette of the dua. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said مَأْكُلُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامٌ وَغُذِيَ بِالْحَرَامٌ His eating was haram and his drinking was haram and his nutrition was haram فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ So how is his supplication going to be answered? And this is one of the reasons we have to stay away from haram when it comes to our dealings, our businesses and our trading. So staying away from riba, staying away from interest, because interest, it can stop your dua being answered. It can stop the dua of your children being answered. It can prevent your salah being accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And other haram which occurs in buying and selling. So this is the first set of conditions, shurut qubul al-amal, the conditions for any action to be accepted by Allah. It has to be upon ikhlas. It has to be according to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a person's income has to be halal. Secondly, shurut al-wujub. The second set of conditions is conditions which have to be fulfilled in order for the salah to be an obligation upon you. So salah, it isn't an obligation upon every single Muslim. We know for example, salah isn't an obligation upon a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old. So there are certain conditions that have to be fulfilled in order for the salah to be an obligation upon you. First of them is al-Islam. The salah, it is an obligation upon the Muslims. The non-Muslim, even if he prays a thousand prayers, then his salah is not accepted. Secondly, al-Aqal. A person has to have intellect. So the one who is mentally disabled, or has a mental illness, the salah is not an obligation upon that person. That person never needs to pray. Why? Because he has a mental disability. Third, al-bulugh. And al-bulugh is being over the age of puberty. And pay attention here. Being over the age of puberty, reaching the age of puberty, this is when the salah is an obligation upon the child as an individual. And this is from shurut al-wujud, from the conditions of an obligation. As for a tamyiz being over the age of seven and then ten, then this is from shurut al-siha. This is from 
those conditions by which your Salah is valid. We'll explain this in a short while. So right now the main thing is, in order for the Salah to be an obligation upon you as an individual, you have to be a Muslim, you have to have a Aqal, you cannot be mentally disabled, you have to be over the age of puberty, and then a Tahara, you have to be upon purity. So the woman who is going through her menses, or bleeding after pregnancy, uh, the salah is not an obligation upon her. She doesn't need to make up the salah. There's no qada upon her. Why? Because it wasn't an obligation upon her in the first place. The first thing she has to make up. As for the salah, then she does not make up. Ummul Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Kunna nu'maru bi qada is siyam, wala nu'maru bi qada is salah. That we, the women, when we went through our monthly bleeding, we were ordered to make up the qada of fasting, but we were never ordered to make up the qada of the prayer. So the prayer is not an obligation upon a, prayer, a woman who is going through the monthly bleeding. Then we come to shurut as siha the conditions that you have to fulfill in order for your salah to be valid and accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first of these conditions is the time. So before you pray, you have to make sure that you are praying the correct prayer for that correct time. You have to make sure that the time has entered for the prayer. And we mentioned the saying of Allah in the Salata Kanata al Mu'mina Kitab Mawputa, the prayer is upon the believers at a legislated time. So there are five daily prayers and there are five times for these daily salawat. And these salawat, Allah has spaced them out in the day and the night. So they don't come all together at one time, so it's difficult for a person. Rather, Allah has spaced them out in the day of a person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He spaced these salawat out in the day and the night to make it easy for a person. So each salah, at the most, how long does it last? Four rak'at or two rak'at? It only lasts five or ten minutes. And then these five prayers, they don't come all at one time. These five or ten minutes that you have to pray, they space throughout the day and the night. Before the people wake up at dawn, and then dhuhr, asa maghrib, and so on and so forth. So, salat al-dhuhr, when is the time for salat al-dhuhr? How do we know that the time for salat al-dhuhr has entered? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned that Salat al-Dhuhr, it starts when the sun has gone past its midpoint, which is called Zawal or it is called the Zenith. Meaning Zawal or the Zenith, this is when the sun is directly above you. And when the sun is directly above us, then we have no shadow. When the sun starts moving towards the west and it's left that high point, the zenith or the zawal, now Salat al Dhuhr has started. So, what will happen? As the sun is slightly moving towards the west, then you will see a shadow on the east side of your body appearing. And this is now the starting of Salat al Dhuhr. And Salat al Dhuhr, it carries on until the sun has gone towards the west so much that the shadow of a person is equal to the length of a person. When your shadow is equal to your length, then this is now the ending of Salat al-Dhuhr. Now this is from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sahih Muslim. He said, وَقْتُ الظُّهُرْ إِذَا زَالَتِ الشَّمْسِ وَكَانَ ظِلُّ الرَّجُلْ كَطُولِهِ that the time of Dhuhr is when the sun has gone past the Zawal. I gone past the midday or its highest point or the zenith, its peak, until Kana Dhillur Rajul Katulihi, the shadow of a person is equal to his length. So a person can use his own body or a person can use a stick, for example. You take a stick, you place it upon the earth. When you see that this stick it doesn't have a shadow. Because the, the sun is right on top of the stick, then you cannot pray Salat al -Dhuhr. Then when the sun starts moving and slowly there's a small shadow which is appearing on the east, 
Now Zohar has started. And when the sun starts going towards the west, so much so that the shadow of this stick is equal to the length of the stick, now Zohar has ended. And then Asr, it starts. So Asr, it starts when the length of the shadow is equal to the length of a person, meaning when Zohar finishes, Asr, it starts. And Asr, it carries on until the, until before sunset when the sun is becoming very yellow. You will notice like today for example that as the sun starts approaching the horizon it becomes a very deep yellow. And this is now the ending of the time of Asr. However the Asr prayer has two times. There is a preferred time and then there is Waqtul Haja. There is a time of need. So the preferred time is to pray Asr as early as possible. And you shouldn't delay it until the sun has become yellow and it's going towards the horizon. But if a person needs to pray it and he hasn't prayed it, then he can pray it even at that stage, but it is not recommended. Then after this is Salatul Maghrib. And Salatul Maghrib, it starts with the name Maghrib. And Maghrib, it means sunset. Meaning when the disk of the sun has disappeared below the horizon, this is now the starting of the Maghrib prayer. When sunset has taken place, I, the, disk of the, the disk of the sun, the edges of the sun have gone below the horizon, now Maghrib prayer has started. And Maghrib prayer, it lasts until uh, the red twilight does not uh, disappear. So you will see on a clear night that just after Maghrib there is a pink or a red glow along the horizon and this they call it the twilight. As long as that red glow does not disappear then this is the, the ending of Salat al-Maghrib. And then when a shafaq al-Ahmar, when this red glow, when that pink line, when the twilight, when it disappears then an Isha starts and Isha, it lasts all the way until the true dawn, which is Al-Fajr. And then you have the Fajr prayer. And the Fajr prayer, it starts with the true dawn. And the true dawn is when light has appeared on the horizon, but the sun has not risen above the uh, horizon. So we have to differentiate between Tulu al-Shams and Tulu al-Fajr, two different things. Tulu al-Shams is when the sun is physically rising above the horizon. Tulu al-Fajr is the break of dawn. And the break of dawn means the light has appeared, but the sun is still below the horizon. And this is called, called Tulu al-Fajr. People often make a mistake when they want to explain fasting or salah to the people, maybe to non-Muslims, they say we, f we start our fast with sunrise to sunset and this is incorrect. F fasting does not start with sunrise. Fasting starts with the break of dawn until sunset. As for sunrise, then there is no ibadah which is attached to it. The ibadah of salah and the ibadah of fasting is attached to the break of dawn and not the sunset itself. And in all of these prayers, it is recommended for a person to pray as early as possible. So the beginning time of the prayer is more recommended than the later time of the prayer, except the Isha. Because one day the Prophet وسلم, he delayed the Isha prayer. And he delayed it, and he delayed it. And then he said to the companions, Innaha la waqtuha, innaha la waqtuha, innaha la waqtuha. Verily this is its best time, meaning as late as possible. Three times, this is its best time. And then he said, Lola and Ashukka ala ummati. However, I fear for my ummah. I fear that this will be too difficult for my ummah, and therefore you can pray it in its earlier time. So, this is the first condition in a very summarized manner. It is that you can only pray the salah if the time for the salah has entered. So, if a person prays dhuhr before dhuhr has entered, his salah is not valid. And then he has to wait for the time for Lord to start and then he has to repeat the prayer which he has prayed. Because that prayer which he prayed 
it is invalid, not accepted. The second uh, shalt, the second condition is sitr al awla that the private parts of a person who is praying have to be covered. And this is called al awla So whoever prays with the awla uncovered and he was able to cover his awla and he knew that his awla was uncovered, then his prayer is not valid. So then the next question is, what is the aura of a person who is praying? The aura of a woman is different to the aura of a man. So the aura of a woman is her whole body apart from her face and her two palms, her two hands. A woman when she prays, doesn't matter if she's praying at home or if she's praying outside in the masjid, she has to cover her whole body. And the aura of a man is between his navel and his knees. This is the awra. And in the prayer, then he should also cover his shoulders. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari al-Muslim, لا يصلي أحدكم في الثوب الواحد ليس على عاتقيه شيء That one of you should not pray in a single garment and there is nothing uh, on his shoulders or his neck. So in the Salah, you have to cover your aura which is between your navel and your knees and as well as have that which is the, the upper part of the body also covered. But for example, the shoulders are not from the aura. So if a person prayed and his shoulder was uncovered, let's say in his vest, the Salah is still valid, it's still valid. The upper arms of a person is not from his aura. Even like the chest of a person, if a person prayed and these buttons were open, then the prayer is still valid. However, when it comes to the Salah, there are two things. There's covering the Aura and then there's something even more than this when it comes to the Salah. And that is beautifying yourself in the Salah. Because Allah said in the Quran, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. O Bani Adam, O children of Adam, beautify yourselves with every masjid, meaning with every salah. So the Muslim has to cover the aura, and then on top of this, when it comes to the salah, do something extra, which is to beautify yourself. So when you pray, you pray in beautiful clothing. And this clothing, it shouldn't be so tight that it is showing the shape of your aura. It shouldn't be see-through or transparent, so that a person can see your aura through the clothing. Rather, a person should pray in beautiful, nice, clean clothing. The third condition that a person has to fulfill before he starts to pray is tahara. And tahara means purification. Meaning you have to be in a state of wudu or you have to be in a state of uh, ghusl. The fourth condition is you have to remove any nijasa from you. And nijasa are and najasat are the impurities, the impure things. And you have to make sure that three things are clean. You have to make sure your body is clean physically, there's no impurity, no najasa upon your body. And you have to make sure your clothing is clean, so there's no najasa upon your clothing that you're going to pray in. And you have to make sure that the place in which you are praying, there's no najasa, no impurity upon the place which you are praying. These three things, we have to ensure all of them are clean. Your body, your clothing, and the place which you are praying. And what are the najasat? The najasat is like urine and feces. And for example, uh, according to some of the ulama, uh, alcohol, according to some of the ulama, blood, according to some of the ulama. Also, for example, a dead carcass which has not been slaughtered properly is from the Najasat and so on and so forth. <coughs> now, if a person prayed a Salah and then after the Salah has finished realized that there was some Najas upon his clothing or his body and he only realized after the Salah then the Salah is valid. Or, if a person he saw there is some najasa upon his clothing before the prayer. He knew. 
and he made the intention to remove the najasa and then he forgot. He honestly made a mistake and he forgot. And then he prayed his prayer and then towards the end when he's finished he remembered once again I forgot to remove the najasa, his salah is still valid and we'll give an evidence for this. If a person in the middle of the salah he realized there is some najasa upon himself or his clothing. So for example, he saw that on his shoes there is some najasa and this is in the middle of the prayer or his hat or his jacket or something like this. If he is able to remove that item of clothing without too many actions then he removes the item of clothing and he carries on with his prayer. So he doesn't need to break the prayer, he doesn't need to start again I'll give you an example. A person is praying outside with shoes on. And halfway, he prayed, he's praying dhuhr, he prayed two rak'at of dhuhr and he didn't know that his shoes had impurity upon them. Then in the third rak'ah, he realizes that his shoes have najasa upon them. If he's able to remove that item without too, many, too much movement, so for example, his shoes, he can just kick them off. Or his hat, he can just take it off. Or even his jacket, he can just take it off without too much movement. Then he takes it off and then he carries on with his prayer, the third and the fourth rak'ah. If, however, he isn't able to remove that item except with a lot of effort and a lot of action, like moving a thaw, in order for a person to remove the thaw, there's going to be a lot of actions for him to remove the thaw. Then his prayer is invalid and he starts again. And the evidence of this is the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. When one day he was praying in Jama'ah and upon his shoes there was some najas and he didn't realize. And then Jibreel Alayhisam came to him whilst the Prophet was praying and informed him there's some najasa on his shoes, on his sandals. So the Prophet وسلم, he kicked off his sandals uh, which had najas upon them and put them to the side. Just with his feet he kicked them off. The Sahaba Alayhi they thought that maybe this is now part of the prayer. So they also followed the Prophet and they kicked their shoes off. And then afterwards they asked the Prophet that why did you remove your shoes in the middle of the prayer? And the Prophet explained that Jibreel came to me and he informed me there is some nijasa, some impurity upon my shoes. The point behind this hadith is the Prophet وسلم, he never started the prayer again. He never made a qada of the first raka'at which he had prayed. He only removed the shoes and then he carried on praying and none of the companions made qadha. So if the item of clothing can be removed very easily without too much trouble like a hat or a glove or shoes or even a jacket then the item of clothing is removed in the middle of the prayer and you carry on with your prayer there is no qadha. If however it takes a lot of action like removing the thaw or undergarments then a person has to stop the prayer and pray again. And then after this, uh, the next condition, the fifth condition is istiqbal al-qibla, that you have to face the qibla. Now facing the qibla, and the qibla is the direction of the Kaaba, the ruling of it also differs. So whoever is standing in front of the Kaaba, by which he can see the Kaaba, then he has to face the Kaaba itself. Now he looks down where he's making sujood but his, his body has to be completely facing the black building the Kaaba itself and this is for the person who is directly standing in front of the Kaaba if a person is standing away from the Kaaba in a different land like in England for example then you have to face the general direction of the Qibla so it isn't a condition that it has to be 100% the Kaaba itself. Especially in times before there was apps and uh, uh, the technology that we have. The Masajid were built and they were facing the direction of the Qibla. And even if they were a few degrees out here or there, there's no problem with this. Because they are facing the general direction of the Qibla. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, فَوَلِّي وَجْهَكَ شَطَرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ F Direct your face towards Al-Masjid Al-Haram وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ And wherever you may be فَوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ شَطَرَ 
then direct your faces towards it, mean towards the general direction of the Qibla. And the facing of the Qibla, a person has to face the Qibla in every single Salah. Whether it's uh, in a masjid or at home or out in an open field, you have to face the Qibla. There are certain times or instances where a person doesn't need to face the Qibla. So the first of them is, the ulama mentioned, if it is in a war. So if it's in a war, and a person needs to pray, or a group of the army needs to pray, they can face the army, even with the guns, they can face the army, and they carry on, and they say their prayer, whilst the other uh, units of the army carry on fighting and defending. Also, for example, if a person is restricted to a direction, a person is paralyzed, na'udhu billah, na'am, a person is jailed in a particular way, or tied down in a particular direction, and the time for the salah is about to finish, he prays whatever the direction he is facing. Also, the ulama mentioned if a person is running away from an enemy or running away from an animal, and the time for the prayer is about to end, unless he's hiding somewhere, then he prays in the way in which he is facing. And finally, the, if a person is praying on a transport, especially if it's nafal, if it's nafal then a person can pray whichever way the camel or the mode of transport is facing. Uh, and how does a person work out which way the Qibla is? There's many different ways. The first of them is to ask somebody. And this is the Asr. You have to ask that person who knows. Also, you can look at the Mihrab of a Masjid. The Mihrab of a Masjid shows you the direction. Also, for example, a person can work it out through knowing where the sun is rising and where the sun is setting. So the direction of the Qibla for England roughly is southeast. So therefore if a person knows where, where west is and where east is according to where the sun is setting and where it is rising then he can work out where is south and north and work out southeast. Also through the stars the people know that this star it is facing the north, it is the north star so the opposite direction is the and like this. Then the sixth condition is the niya. A person has to have the correct intention. And when we say a person has to have an intention, meaning he has to know in his heart and his mind that he's praying the salah. The salah of this time he is praying. So let's say a person in a Muslim country, he hears the adhan. And when he hears the adhan, he knows, okay, I'm now going to the masjid in order to pray salah then this is sufficient. And the niya, it is in the heart and it is not verbalized upon the tongue and this is an innovation. And also, from the conditions in order for the salah to be valid is a tamiz. And a tamiz means the age of mental maturity, meaning seven years old. So, we have three ages and we finish with this. There is seven years old, there is ten years old, and then there is puberty. When a child is seven, then the obligation is not upon the child to pray. The obligation is upon the wali, the father and the mother, to order the child and train and teach the child to pray. So, when the child is seven, who is going to be sinning if the child isn't being taught to pray? Not the child, because the child is only seven. But the wali, the mother and the father, if they are not training their children, ordering their children and bringing their children to the masjid with them, are seven years old, then they are responsible and the sin is upon them. Then the next age is ten years old. Also, when a child is ten years old, then the prayer is valid and accepted. But again, who is responsible for the prayer? It is the wali. Because the Prophet wasallam. He ordered the guardian to discipline the child if he does not pray. And they are 10 years old. So the obligation still remains upon the guardian. That the guardian has to uh, order and discipline the child for not praying. And then there is Buru. Then there is puberty. So when the Muslim is now going to 11, 12, 13 years, going towards puberty, now the obligation is upon him. 
no longer is the obligation upon the parent. And this why this is why I say that it isn't correct for a Muslim who is 13, 14, 15 and he's reached the age of puberty. Why did he not pray Fajr? My mom didn't wake me up. My dad didn't wake me up. They don't have to wake you up. It's your responsibility to put your alarm on and you have to wake yourself up and then you wake the others in your household. So these actions a person has to fulfill uh, before he prays Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina wa sallam and I think food is being served in China.